Please welcome to the stage Netroots Nation board member and Action Network's executive director, Brian Young. Thank you. I don't like podiums, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, those that clicked on the link, thank you for clicking on a link to watch us. Um, and especially those of you that stuck through a couple years of virtual conferences with Netroots Nation. We're finally able to get back together. Uh, Netroots Nation is about us coming together. So a big shout out, they don't get a shout out enough and they didn't tell me to do this, but shout out to the Netroot staff. Um, they've done an amazing job sort of shepherding through, making up a virtual conference on the fly a couple years ago. Um, and you know, Netroot started, oh God, it was 2006, I didn't go, but the, uh, you know, it was really around using digital technology to exercise power um, and to mobilize power. And you know, we should celebrate the successes around that. You know, back then, um, the dream was to have a party funded by small donors. Now it's a reality. Uh, and today, we're going to have a series of conversations to really look to the future from here. You know, how do we build sustained power in communities? How, we, how do we move past just mobilization to real organizing? And we're going to start with a couple of really great um, topics around organizing the place where a lot of the power imbalances in our society really work is in our workplaces. So a little bit later, and then we're going to get some uh, conversations about some really important issues like the Supreme Court. Um, as the intro mentioned, uh, board member here, but also the executor, executive director of Action Network. And recently, um, we started working with a really great set of people, the Amazon Labor Union. Give it up. Um, so the conversation I'm going to have is with Chris. And before I jump to Chris, I want to acknowledge right here at the front table are the workers from Amazon that formed the Amazon Labor Union with Chris. So we're going to talk about, with Chris, um, some uh, ways of moving forward and ways you can support them and really where this all comes from. So without any further ado from me, I want to introduce Chris Smalls, the founder and uh, leader of the Amazon Labor Union. Been a, it's been a haul for you. And I, you know, some people probably know the story. I mean, the first time you crossed my sort of awareness is uh, you're doing an event outside of Jeff Bezos' house in DC, um, living in the DMV, I saw that. But w what got you going? Why did you start? They fired me. They picked the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> that simple, I mean, yeah, we, I was hired uh, in 2015, um, came at entry level, and I worked hard, got promoted up into a process assistant, better known as assistant manager. I was in that position for four and a half years. I applied to be a salary manager over 50 times. Uh, never got it. Only got interviewed twice. I opened up three buildings for this company, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, JFK with my last facility and um, I was already mentally done and drained before you know COVID. COVID was a life or death situation so um, you know I couldn't just leave the people that I spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week with um, so I took further action and um, when they fired me you know a week or two after that that's when Jeff Bezos and his general counsel uh, David Sapolsky decided to have a meeting, calling me not smart or articulate, but they also said to make me the face of the whole unionizing efforts. So I said, good idea. <laughs> and um, that's when we started to travel and we ended up in New York City at his once $80 million mansion. Now it's probably worth over 140 because um, he keeps buying floors in the same penthouse like he needs any more bedrooms. and. Um, we went from New York, then we ended up in D.C. 
We set up a guillotine. <laughs> That's what you're talking about. <laughs> and um, we went out west to Beverly Hills. So it's a $165 million mansion. And then from there, we went to Seattle, his first home, his headquarters, the Spears, Bill Gates' house on the way. And then we came back um, to New York and decided to unionize a year later. And 20, on our birthday, 420, 2021. 420. <laughs> 2021. <laughs> we started the Amazon Labor Union. Yeah. It, uh, why a union? What's important about forming a union? Well, um, these companies are at will companies, and they deemed us as essential workers. So that doesn't even make sense right there. We're at will, but we're a necessity. You need us. We're essential workers uh, with no protections, no job security, no decent living wage, no real paid medical leaves. Um, we're disposable. Um, having a union provides the protections that we need, the job security, the wages, the health benefits, the pension, the free college, the list goes on and on. And having a union has representation that workers don't have. And Amazon workers especially uh, don't have any of that because we get fired by an app or an A to Z app or a computer or email. So forming this union is, uh, is everything. And we know from our campaign that we have to take care of one another. Yeah, and I, uh, a little bit of news if people didn't see it, but you had a, you had a nice expansion this, this week. That's right. Shout out to Albany, ALB1. So second unit, and you know, the, uh, we were talking a couple of days ago, um, you know, the, like you said, union's everything, but you know, you also are building a movement around this. And you spent the summer, uh, hot labor summer, you've been traveling around. Uh, what was that about, and wh why do you think it's necessary to do that kind of work? I started at Labor Notes, um, Chicago, having 4,000 people in that room with Bernie. And I said, you know, we're going to leave here, we're going to go organize across the country. So I said the Hot Labor Summer Tour begins. And from that moment, I I've been to over 20-something cities, uh, traveling the country, spreading the message, and um, inspiring people and motivating people to get involved. But also sharing that message that as labor, we got to be on the same page. And labor is a movement, we got to move together. And everybody has to be David going up against Goliath. It's not just the ALU. The ALU broke the barrier, but now we all got to storm the door. So we have to get ready, you know? And the best thing we can do as people in the working class is we hold our labor and general strike. And the other thing we were talking about is, you know, you made the point that, you know, we're all the working class. If you're not 1%, you're, you're, you know, the power is, balance is there. And, uh, you know, also that a lot of the, um, a lot of the power, uh, you know, a lot of the issues play out in our workplaces. So, you know, solidarity is key. Because um, there's a lot of people here that represent a lot of different issues, a lot of different organizations. But, uh, you know, you, you mentioned banding together is really important. And where, like, where's your vision going from here? Well, you heard what I told Lenny, uh, Lindsay, uh, um, Mrs. Graham. <laughs> it's not a left or a right thing. It's a workers thing. And we're in a new time for labor. It's a new school labor, new generation of labor. And there's a lot of dinosaurs in leadership. Let's be real. A lot of dinosaurs in, off in office that don't want to allow us to blossom and, and create the change that we need in society. We got to tell them they got to get out of the way. You know, it's, it's our time now, you know? And it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you know, 
Amazon, Starbucks, Walmart, Target, Instagram users, Facebook users, Times Magazine, gig workers, Google workers, Apple, Trader Joe's, Kellogg's, the list goes on and on. All these industries that are fighting, we all have the same struggle, it's the same fight. And um, we have to hold our unions accountable as well. And, and that's where we are in the labor movement. It's up to all of us. And we have to be on the same accord. Because the other side, let me tell you, they're pouring billions and trillions of dollars into stopping organized labor, creating autonomous jobs, creating jobs where they're going to take away from working class people. They're already doing it. The Amazon Gold stores, these cashless stores, you go to the airport now and you can't even talk to a person. They got you checking in at the machine. That's what happens when you hit one click buy. You got Labor Days, Does it, you know, it's created for labor and you have plans for this Labor Day. Oh yeah, big plans. I'm shutting, I'm shutting New York City the hell down. Hell yeah. Open invite too. I'm inviting everybody here. Pull up at Howard Schultz house at noon. What's up Howard, we coming for you. And then we going to march to Jeff Bezos. We've been there plenty of times, he know us. And then we're going to shut it down in Times Square, the heart of capitalism. And I'm inviting everybody to join us. And uh, we're going to amplify the fact that we haven't been recognized in any of these campaigns, including the Starbucks campaigns that's sweeping the nation. And we have to recognize the fact that these companies are breaking the law every day, firing workers, exploiting workers, workers are dying in warehouses and nobody's being held accountable. So we have to take back the real meaning of Labor Day. So this ain't no damn parade. This is really a call to action and bringing back the real meaning of Labor Day and unions and leaders of the movement and the working class people shall all take the streets. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, uh... I'll add, for every, everyone's here, it's in New York, go. If you're not in New York, but you have membership in New York, find some ALU people and find out how you can get your membership out there with them. Because um, it is about solidarity. And you know everybody who's working to build progressive power, worker power is central to it. Looking out past Labor Day, what you got coming? In the fall, 2024. I haven't created the hashtag yet, but I'm, I'm leaning towards a cold labor winter. Um, it's going to be um, a lot of uh, wildfire strikes and wildcat strikes. Um, it's going to be a lot more campaigns. Um, we're not done with the ALU. We're getting buildings pretty much every day. There's going to be uh, an uprising of campaigns. It's going to be an uprising of the labor movement. And right now, everybody has a role to play. If you can't come on the ground, there's other ways to get involved. Start by having that conversation with yourselves. You gotta cancel those primes. Start with your family members. Start with your relatives, your community. If you go to Starbucks, order your drink, Union Strong. Little things like that, details like that, showing workers that the community cares for them. That matters. And donate into our funds. You know, we want to go on strike. And I'm talking about Amazon workers too. It's about that time. As we know, just like Starbucks, they're not going to come to the table. They're not going to recognize us. There's already been stores on strike. We're asking everybody here to prepare yourselves to have a solidary fund donation for the Amazon labor union as well. Because we're going to have buildings that's going to be starting their campaigns nationwide. So I'm asking for your support today and every worker here that helped that campaign to its victory. These are your brothers and sisters that come from your communities. We look just like y'all. We're asking everybody here to get involved. 
So if you have an email list, if you have members, if you have delegation, you have fellowships, you have ways of fundraising for us, we want to make sure that we, uh, we collect all of that because we're going to need it going up against Amazon. So showing solidarity starts now. We all have a mission, and we're asking for your help. And it, it's amazonlaborunion.org, and click on the Donate button for the Solidarity Fund. Um, so everyone here, take out your phones after this. Everyone that's watching, do that. Um, and then, of course, you can get connected to all the other actions coming up. Where do you think this is going? Where do you, where do you want this to be in 24, 25? What's... Well, I definitely want to see us with a contract. <laughs> that's that's damn right. One thing. Yeah. That's the only thing that matters right now is getting us a contract. Uh, once we get a contract, you know, um, that's going to help other industries have better contracts. It's going to help inspire other workers to really form their unions now, because it's possible. And it started with Amazon, the, the, what's going to be um, the number one retailer in the world in a couple of years. One out of every four Americans is going to have worked or know somebody who worked at this company. So we don't stop them at the gates. We're talking about the Death Star here. Seriously, pinky in the brain. It's like they want to take over the world. Amazon looking at your medical records now. They're buying insurance companies. We're talking about a bookstore. So we have to be resilient against this company. We have to say enough is enough. Jeff Bezos has more than enough money. And it's time they pay their fair share. So stand in solidarity with the workers. All right. Thank you. Great. It's great to hear Chris. Like I said, ALU, you can talk to any Action Network staff as well. Chris is going to be around the rest of the day. Everyone go to the party. Chris and the crew will be there tonight. Thank you all. Next, coming up, we're going to hear from Abigail Disney, who's uh, coming out with a, a world premiere here. Uh, teaser for the new documentary. We're really looking at the seedy underside of how Disney treats its workers. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Chris. Welcome Abigail Disney, Sarah Nelson, and Artemis Bell. Amazon is the Death Star. It actually is. He's right. Cancel Prime. Um, I say that as somebody who hasn't yet canceled Prime, and I'm going to do it as soon as I go home. So there. I'm Abigail Disney, and thank you all so much for being here. And Thank you to everybody. I'm going to look at the camera and say thank you to everybody who's clicking their way in here. I'm really grateful. Um, yes, I'm related. My grandfather was Roy O. Disney. His brother was Walt Disney. And together they built this company, Walt Disney Company. I was born in 1960, so I knew my grandfather about 11 years. Kind of worshipped the ground he walked on. He was a very sweet guy. He was also a member of the John Birch Society. He hated unions. He was a red-baiting, right-wing guy. Um, I went to the park with him a lot when I was a kid. And I will tell you this, in spite of everything I just said to you, he was the nicest man. And when I went to the park with him and followed him in there, what I always noticed, I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> Such an impact. Um, <laughs> What I always noticed was the way he greeted workers and the way they greeted him. What happened between them was a thing that was happening between two human beings. My grandfather never saw himself as different from or other than anybody who worked for him. And as a business person, he understood that half of his job was to make money for investors. The other half of his job, and maybe the most important half, was to, to do that in a way that created living, not livings, but livelihoods for the people who had jobs for him. 
So say what you like about his politics back then. But he died in 1971, and I watched things change, as Ernest Hemingway said, gradually and then suddenly. Between 1971 and now, everything has changed for every worker everywhere, but inside of the Walt Disney Park is something that I've had a front row seat for. So I made a film called The American Dream and Other Fairy Tales. And it is about how that process happened inside of the park at Disneyland, which I experienced personally. Um, and I made it because I wanted to, once and for all, make it human. I, I could list to you all the regulations that were shifted, all the money that was changing hands. I could list to you a thousand reasons why it is the way it is now. But the fact is, you have to feel it because this is about human beings. Um, and a film was the best way I could think of to do that. So I'm really happy to premiere for you our trailer for The American Dream and Other Fairy Tales now. You can start it up. Disneyland was not like anywhere else on Earth. When I started working at the park, the employees were so happy to be there. The company appreciated you. At least it did. Having the last name Disney is like having a weird superpower you didn't ask for. But then one day, I got a message from a guy named Ralph who worked at Disneyland. How many of you know somebody who works at Disney who slept in their car in the last oh. couple of years? How many of you know somebody who have gone without medical care oh. because they can't afford it? <laughs> the American dream teaches us that if you work hard enough, anything is possible. It's magical thinking. Dr. Disney. Disney could raise the salaries of all of its workers to a living wage. It was possible to do this when my great uncle and grandfather built the company. It's possible now. That is socialism. We, we know socialism. what that is. We're the people who do the pixie dust tonight. You scrub the kitchens, the floor, the toilets. With both of us working full time, we still fall below poverty level. A custodian would have to work for 2,000 years to make what Bob Iger makes in one. The Disney company is round zero of the widening inequality in America. You know, I think of it as the assholification of America. This isn't just a Disney story. It's the story of nearly half of American workers who can't make ends meet. I have this passion growing within me now, building power for working class people like me. If you could tell Disney anything, what would you tell them? We'd like to be able to have a home. Thank you for that. Um, you're the first audience to lay eyes on it, so it's kind of exciting to premiere. I am not up here to tell you about how this is supposed to work. That's not really my job as a member of the 1%. Um, so I'm up here with Sarah Nelson, wonderful Sarah Nelson, who's head of the Association of Flight Attendants. Yes. And one of the most exciting and best labor organizers in this country now, and maybe even ever, <laughs> um, she's extraordinary. Our Tamas Bell is next to me. She's in our film. She worked at Disney for 11 years as a custodian on the night shift. Um, when I met her uh, in 2018, 2017, you were making 11.25 an hour. Um, she's been very active in her union. That's why I met her. Um, and her frustration with the company, which grew uh, over the time I knew her, um, ended with her leaving the company in 2021. She's now working as a barista at Starbucks, managing an Airbnb, and going back to school. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, glad. so capitalism. Let's talk about capitalism for a minute. It's been very, very good for me, right? Um, but you'd have to have a, a, some kind of blindfold on not to notice that it's not very good for most of everyone. 
and over the many, many years that it's had a hold of our country's throat, it has manifested very different ways. It has always depended on the personality of the people who were in charge of it. And the personality in charge of it today, I would say, is Ebenezer Scrooge. Um, I know you all grew up watching like Simpsons versions of Christmas Carol and you know whatever 150 different versions of a Christmas Carol, but actually I recommend the book um, by Charles Dickens because what it is about is the idea that greed, if it runs you, winds up not just being a character problem for an individual person, it winds up being a social problem for everybody around that individual, and it winds up being an existential problem in its setting. So capitalism in its current incarnation is under a, a Scrooge epic, um, and I'm not really joking when I say that. Um, I was, in 1987, a 27-year-old woman sitting in a theater watching the movie Wall Street, and in New York City, and I saw when Gordon Gekko said, greed is good, I saw the way the audience erupted into applause. And I thought, oh my God, we're in trouble. So we need it to change, and the question is, is capitalism the problem, <laughs> Sarah? And if so, uh, what's the problem, and can it be changed? Fundamentally, the problem is that capitalism is about profits, it's not about people. So it will never, ever, ever work. And what we have to understand is that democracy is on the brink of collapse because we exist in a system of capitalism. And as unions have been on decline, capitalism has been totally unchecked. So it's taking over everything. And now it's just about billionaires um, deciding, you know, competing with each other over who's going to go up in the fastest dick rocket up to the moon while they leave the rest of us on the burning earth. Um, so unless we, unless we, you know, unless we build unions and give people a real voice to put them in check, because um, the only people that billionaires have to respond to are uh, unions. Mm -hmm. Chris Smalls, ALU, Starbucks workers. They, and if we get around those workers who are doing that, who are taking that on, who are striking, who are doing all the right things, then we can take on the billionaires, and they don't have to answer to anyone else, and if we let them keep going on their terror campaign, it's just going to get worse and worse because there is no end to that profit society. In fact, we're gonna go to uh, where Heather McGee would say we'd go back to in a plantation Plantation's economy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know, I know these people, you know? I, I know them. They, they are people I've known in my lifetime, and what I have seen is that um, there is no point at which they have enough. No. And it makes them sicker and sicker. One of the interesting things about Ebenezer Scrooge is he's not a well man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think Dickens did that on purpose because it sucks you know, your life force out of you to have forgotten the meaning of life. Um, and I remember when I first started advocating quietly with the leadership at Disney, I would suggest that perhaps instead of the childcare program, which is nice, and instead of, you know, maybe a, a small education program, which is nice, they raise wages. Like, money is what, <laughs> how are we not, and they would, honest to God, I thought I was speaking some crazy foreign language. They honestly didn't understand what I was getting at. So, Artemis, I mean, what, what did the union mean for you at Disney? What did it feel like to be a member of that union? Um, and, and like, did you feel like the union was having any kind of success? I mean, with Disney, that was my first ever union job, and I kind of walked in on it on accident. I didn't understand what I was walking into, so for like the first couple years at Disney, I just kind of did my own thing, and I was like, hey, I have health care, yay. Um, but then I started looking around at other custodial jobs that were comparable, and I was like, why do we make three to five dollars less than all these other places? Um, so it, for me, a union at the time when I first started, it was a way to actually get your voice heard a little bit when you ask those questions. Because if you ask a lower level manager, who was all I had access to as a regular cast member, they're not in the position to change any of that usually. 
Um, but if you, as a representative of your union, are going up and asking the questions, you're asking the people who are actually negotiating on the company's behalf a lot of the time. And sometimes you're standing outside of Disney Studios shouting at Bob Iger with petitions. <laughs> but um, That's a fun part. It was for me. But, um, <laughs> like, as, as we went through the entire process and... I went through one and a half contract negotiations before I ultimately burnt out. I will never say a union is a bad thing, but it's a human organization and everybody has their own goals and their own egos. And sometimes I don't think people necessarily forget who they're fighting for, but I think sometimes they forget that they have to be collaborative. Nobody wants to be told how to fix their life not even from the people who are saying, hey, I'm trying to help you get more money. Like, if that person is just coming in and telling you how they feel you should do something, then, then like, they're not necessarily going to be responsive to that. Chris said something, Sarah, that you brought up while we were in the green room. Can you, can you say that again? Because I think it's a little bit the answer to the problem Artemis is talking about. Yeah, I was talking to the postal workers earlier this week and he said, you know, fundamentally, we all go through some shit. And how did we win at ALU? We just we loved each other. Hmm. Yeah. I have to say that, that you know, this is, this is rooted in love when it succeeds. And um, it's about humans connecting with each other always. I will tell you that my grandfather would have rather been shot than have unions at the park when he opened it up in 1955. But the law in 1955 didn't permit him to open a park without labor unions involved. And that is an important piece of this puzzle, right? I mean, yeah. union membership will grow in power as it grows in size. But what has to change politically and legally speaking? Because in 1955, they were wildly more empowered by the government. What do we need to be working for on the government side? Well, listen, I mean, first of all, we have some power right now and we should use it. We can't be risk averse right now. Um, we have got to, I, I would like to see uh, President Biden call Howard Schultz and Jeff Bezos to the table and say he's gonna mediate talks, uh, collective bargaining to get contracts there. Um, let's, let's use the power that we have because uh, Jennifer Bruzzo overseeing the NLRB, yeah, that's great. She doesn't have enough resources, doesn't have enough people to track down all the law breaking that's going on everywhere. And it takes so long that, you know, they walk through the four Ds of union busting, divide, delay, distract, and ultimately demoralize. And so if we don't get on this right now and lift up the people who are, you know, taking a chance right now, we have Starbucks workers, Starbucks baristas all over the country striking right now. The workers are doing what they need to do to build power for all of us. Because I'll tell you something, what I learned in a craft specific union for flight attendants is that if we don't get busy standing up for the rest of the working class, there's no way that I could be the labor leader that they expect me to be and need me to be. They can't get the vacation that they need, the sick time that they need to take care of their families without getting fired. They can't get that secure retirement to be able to actually leave work. They can't get the housing near where they work. They have to spend hours and hours just getting to work in order to try to get that paycheck. And they can't spend the time at home to enjoy their lives with the people who count and where their lives exist. As Jennifer Bates said, we're the billionaires, we just don't spend it. Mm. And we, <laughs> do not live to work, we work to live. And to me, that really is a reflection of what Mother Jones was telling us 100 years ago when the great labor organizer, Mother Jones, was fighting against child labor. And she said, the capitalists say there is no need of labor organizing, except <laughs> the fact that they themselves are continually organizing shows their real beliefs. They want the most money for, or they want the most labor for the least amount of money Labor wants the most money for the least amount of labor. Labor builds the world's palaces and builds all the wealth, but neither lives in the palaces nor spends the wealth. If you would only understand that you hold the whole solution in the palm of your hand, for if every industry 
or to simply hold up together and stop working. The capitalists would yield to any and all demands, for the world could simply not go on. And so we have to understand that we have to make them risk averse. We have to make them understand that there is big risk for putting our lives on the line by pushing people into poverty. That is the violence. Capitalism is the violence in this country. And workers simply standing with their hands in their pockets can stop everything and take all the power that is actually ours. And then we're going to take our money back. And uh, let me just say, I, I don't want to go on too long, but you know, there are companies who are looking at this risk and making different decisions. Microsoft just agreed to a neutrality agreement with CWA for Activision Blizzard. And that's because they're looking in their backyard at Starbucks and Amazon and saying, OK, we don't want to take on that fight. We don't want to be named as the evil empire. They try to shame us. They try to make us feel bad about our bodies as women. They try to make us feel bad about not being able to pay the bills, not being able to have a house, not being able to take care of our children. They try to shame, shame, shame. It is time that we shame the people who need to be shamed. Because shame on them, and they will never feel it, but if they feel it in their pocketbooks, they're going to make that risk analysis and they are going to change. And we are this close to doing it if people would understand that we only join together just like Chris was talking about. You know, the, the, it's like the definition of alienation in a society when the shame attaches in the very opposite place. And, and talk about alienation in society, but Chris just referred to the fact that you can be an essential but disposable yeah. worker. That's a violation of the meanings of things, not to mention the meanings of lives and the point of work. Artemis, you came to Disney, and, and what did they tell you about um, what was going on in terms of loyalty to the company, retention? Because like lots of us are talking about retention now right, in right. the world of work. I mean, when I first uh, hired in at Disney, it was right after the 2008, um, my brain. Um, but it was right there after that downturn, and we weren't sure that we were coming back up through it yet. And when I, the hiring person who was interviewing me was saying I was very lucky because third shift custodial uh, jobs didn't come up that often. But slowly throughout my tenure there, they had more and more turnover when in my department, which made it difficult for us all to do our jobs and meant that the quality of the work was not to the level that many people wanted to do because of their pride in their own work and their pride in working for Disney. But within that same couple of weeks when I did my introduction uh, course, one of the little trainers, she said, when we have a family come into the park right now, a lot of the times that family had to save up for longer than usual because of the state of the world at the time. And like this was like their opportunity to escape the darkness of the world at the time. And they wanted to create that escape and they wanted it to be a happy place. And I don't 100% know if that was just like the attitude of the cast member at that level or if it was completely disconnected from the attitude from the higher level executives, which I do think it probably was, because even then it was Bob Iger and it was all about money for him. But like the attitude that I was brought into the company from the get-go with is we are there to make the world a little brighter for the people who are coming into the park and everybody who was in the park just want, who worked at the park just wanted to be happy and make those moments for families and be a little bit of brightness in a very dark world. So to what extent, I mean, I think of that as the goodwill subsidy, yeah. that, that people came in wanting to make the world a better place and were sometimes willing to work longer or for less because they knew that the job itself had a, had a, a ben beneficial meaning. Yeah. Do you think the company exploited that in their workers? I do think that they exploit that to a certain extent because while there were people who had the financial stability, if it was a retirement job or a little fun job for a spouse um, or a non-primary earning spouse, then 
you know, you could afford to just be there for the benefits or be there for the perks like the sign-ins and whatnot and then just go and make everybody smile. And like, that's lovely. I have no issue with that, but then you had people like myself and many others who are in our documentary and like you're trying to survive. I, I was in one of the positions that was full time and like I had no wiggle room for any kind of emergency and other people were living in their cars and there were people who struggled to take care of their children and I feel like some of that goodwill subsidy as you call it like is left over from when it was originally founded because when Walt and Roy were in charge, they treated people like humans and people were able to like actually raise a family and have a home on a full-time job at Disney. And like that's the impression that a lot of people still had. I, I think Disney's gotten a little bit of negativity lately, so maybe a little bit of the gauze is off of people's eyes, but I think even now, certainly when I started there, a lot of people still saw it as the Walt Disney Company. They still saw it as a company that they felt that they would be able to raise a family in. And like in my department especially, they were very fond of the quote um, from, from Walt, it's a famous exchange where his wife said, well, why would you want to build a theme park? They're dirty. And he was like, but that's the point. Mine won't be. And we often coupled it with the quote about, you can build the most wonderful place in the world, but, it, but it needs the people. And I, I paraphrase that, but, but you know, that was very important to a lot of the people who work there, but they didn't always feel, the longer you work there, the less you felt that sentiment from the actual management, right. and the less you felt that sentiment right. when you're like having an emergency. Yeah. I mean, my grandfather was very clear. He understood that, like, these were the most important aspect of what was happening were the human beings at the park and the way they behaved as human beings toward other human beings. These were not interchangeable parts. And I think it's, I started with my grandfather's politics for a reason. Um, isn't it interesting that in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, a right wing, very far right wing guy, would run his business, nevertheless, with an, an eye toward his responsibility of the people who work for him. Yes, it's paternalism. Yes, it's all kinds of things that we object to. But like at a human level, there was the right thing was happening from this right-wing guy. Flash forward now, you have CEOs, the last two CEOs of the company, huge Democratic Party donors, huge Democratic Party donors. There's no word out of their mouth that wouldn't be agreeable to most Democrats. And yet to them, increasing their workers' pay felt like a bridge too far. How did this country become so captured by the idea that what management needs is more important than what humans need? So broadly and so across the board um, that now it's the message is being carried perhaps with more consistency by the Democratic Party than by the Republican Party. It's because the Democrats have taken for granted the idea that they will be supported by labor because they don't have an option in the Republican Party, and they swallowed the neoliberal line whole and never questioned it. Sarah, <laughs> then how do we turn the Democratic Party into a genuine partner? Is it possible? <laughs> I mean, the only reason we have labor law at all in this country is because of mass strikes. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I would right. say that the, the tone that was set in the 30s, 40s, and 50s was um, that you had to think about the people because the people were demanding it, and the yeah. people had the institutions to be able to, um, to, to continue to demand that. Unions had enough power, had enough density uh, to be able to make a difference. And um, so th that, that's how we're going to bring any party around because frankly, at the time, the Republicans were kissing labor butt too. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, because labor had power. And uh, that's, that's the only way that we're going to change anything uh, in this society. You know, it was uh, Milton Friedman 
who set the tone in the boardrooms to say that greed is good. And that, it, you know, it's interesting because we can shame Disney all day long, and we should. <coughs> and by the way, there's 41,000 uh, service workers in Orlando that are gonna be in contract negotiations this next year, and we should get ready to support them too. And, um, but we also need to, we need to make sure that we're attacking the entire system. Because I know CEOs who actually maybe might want to do the right thing, but they're in a system where they are having to respond to Wall Street. Yes. Uh, and, and so when, when we went to the airline CEOs and told them, listen, you are not going to get a dollar of federal aid when the industry is shut down, 97% of the demand has left, and the industry is about to collapse, you're not going to get a dollar of aid because everyone hates you. Yeah. Because you have, you know, taken everything and made it a, a, an incredible experience of inequality when you walk on that plane. The people are having the American experience when they walk on an airplane through first class, then through business class, then through a little bit smaller seats, but kind of nice and a little bit far apart, then even closer seats and smaller seats. And then you have to be so glad that you have a place to put your ass at the end of the plane, but you can't put any place to put your bag unless you pay for that too. Um, so. That is, you know, that's where we were pre-pandemic, and we said to them, you're not going to get anything unless you make the relief workers first. And I will tell you, what they agreed to in the room that night, in one night, was they would agree to ban stock buybacks and even cap their own pay, but they would not agree to simply follow the law that says that you have to stay out of union organizing. Because they knew that banning the stock buybacks and capping their pay would be temporary, but if the unions there were there forever and we're going to hold them accountable and we're going to bring the money our way and not be sending it to Wall Street. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is the system that we're in, and we have to understand we have to take on Amazon, Starbucks, Disney, Delta Airlines. We have to take on these companies together. Because if they're allowed to get away with undermining anyone, they're going to do it everywhere. And Artemis said a really important thing. You know, she said that in, in her unit, in her um, group of workers who were working as custodians at Disney, there were, people were there for all kinds of different reasons. They were there in retirement jobs. They were there because they really were, this was their, uh, their main job and they were trying to provide for a family and they couldn't. They were there because of the allure of Disney and maybe they had um, some other uh, income to be able to make it work. Um, the truth is that every single worker takes pride in the work that they do. The TSA workers who go through shit every day <laughs> and take yeah. the worst, uh, you know, scrutiny at work, people getting angry with them as they're asking them to undress and, <laughs> and go through all their things. They said they were sleeping in their cars during the government shutdown so that they could go to work because they couldn't afford the gas to go back and forth because they were because leaving they that close working. on the line that when they missed one paycheck, they couldn't even afford a, king, a tank of gas to go back and forth. But they were more committed to going to work and doing a good job in the, one of the worst jobs, not one of the best jobs where you have that pride. This is the truth about the American worker and the lie that is being told is wrong. But these jobs that have been defined as jobs that are worthless are typically jobs that are held by women and people yes. of color. And right. the, the age, the union busters' favorite tactic is sexism and racism. Yeah. And they will play that up to the best yeah. of their ability and try to pit us against each other and in, yeah. in that way try to control the yeah. environment and define those jobs. And when people are desperate, they'll take anything they can get. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I want, I want to add one more layer to this ecosystem that needs to change because I get calls from reporters to talk about the pay for Disney workers, and then I get called from a different set of workers, a different set of reporters to talk about excessive CEO pay. It, the business <laughs> reporting system reflects the idea that one thing has nothing to do with the other. The, even in the business press, they're thinking of a CEO as someone completely different yes. from a person who pulls down a weekly paycheck. And this is true across Wall Street and the entire economic ecosystem. Yeah. If they came out and offered workers $25 an hour tomorrow, yeah. the CEO would be out of a job, the stock would be downgraded. So there's an enormous amount of work that we have to do. And when the unions are empowered, and they will be over the next 10 years, they are going to 
really, in fact, have their moment, yes. they need to come back to Wall Street and they need to alter Wall Street because Wall Street has been calling the score for too long. Yep. Um, so we have three action items for you. The first one is related to the film, The American Dream and Other Fairy Tales. Um, tomorrow, we're screening the whole film at 12.30 in room 104. There is free food for the first 100 people who show up because <laughs> we know how the world really works. Um, Artemis will be there with me for a Q&A afterwards. I really hope you'll come. I really think the film has a chance of breaking through. Um, we also want you to find us and follow us on social media and, uh, and sign up for our mailing list because we're going to open um, in some cities, but also on video on demand on September 23rd. We need all the help you can get in social media support. We, we are up against the biggest media company in the world and they really don't want this movie to find people, right? So there isn't a streamer in the system that would touch us. There wasn't a distributor in the system that would trust us. We've had to do this ourselves. We have got Goliath out there ready to stomp on us. Please help us with that. I don't look like David, but I am. Um, <laughs> And, and you can host a screening, and you can learn about that on our website. Please use your networks to support us. Um, the second thing is that if you will scan this QR code from the Association of Flight Attendants, it will give you the ability to learn more about share buybacks. Um, Sarah mentioned them earlier. Just to give you a, a sense of it, between in the one decade before the pandemic started, Disney spent $50 billion dollars in free cash flow on share buybacks. Free cash flow. That means the money that's just lying around there. They're looking the union square in the face and saying, we can't give you a raise, while they are giving the top 2% of the population all of that cash back in the form of share buybacks, and themselves, by the way. This is a direct transfer of wealth from workers to owners, and it needs to stop. They were illegal until 1984. They need to be stopped. $50 billion in 10 years. So go find out about share buybacks, sign the petition. We need to start a real movement about ending this practice because it's incredibly corrupt. And the third is a pretty simple one. Support your unions. Join the union. Support anybody you know who's a member of a union. Yes, my grandfather is right now spinning in his freaking grave because I'm saying this. <laughs> but we're not going to be able to get this out of goodwill. Law will never get us far enough. Culture change will never get us far enough until the unions are permanently empowered and to big, be big enough and fight as equals against corporate interests. We are never going to get this to change. So thank you so, so much for everything. And uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm going to put a fine point on the joint unions. Um, women, young people, people of color, trans people, join unions, run unions. We need yes. your creativity. We need other people to see you in leadership. You are the leaders of our future, and people need to see um, who it is that can form unions because they have an idea that it's somebody in a hard hat. And it's not. It's all of us. It's everyone who works. We are the working class. They are the billionaires. We're getting together. We're taking our money back. You want to say anything, Anna, about unions? Oh, you've got three seconds. Go. Join <laughs> unions. <laughs> Watch Thanks. the film. Spread the film. It's amazing. Solidarity forever. For our next segment, let's welcome Sarah Lipton Lubit, Latasha Brown, and Emma Hernandez. Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Lipton Lubet, Executive Director of Take Back the Court, where we are all court reform all the time because the Supreme Court is super messed up. Uh, and I am so glad uh, to be here with all of you today, uh, and most especially to be here with these amazing, amazing women who are some of the best advocates in the business. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves, and then we will get rolling. Latasha. Greetings, how are y'all doing? How you doing that, Roots? 
I am Latasha Brown. I am co-founder of Black Voters Matter. We're a power building organization based in the South, and we do three things. One, we work to put money on the ground to grassroots groups. Secondly, we are working to mobilize and build a movement that is rooted in social justice and change. And third, we're shifting a message. We're creating a message that people, in fact, have power. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Hernandez. I am the communications manager at We Testify. We are an organization dedicated to the leadership and representation of people who have abortions. And so every day we are working to center and broaden the narrative um, that is told in the public sphere about uh, abortion havers, uh, their lives, and how they come upon that decision, as well as the many barriers they have that traverse to access care. Thank you so much, thank you both. And I think no one is surprised here, right, uh, that the folks we have on this stage today when we're talking about the Supreme Court are experts in abortion access, in voting rights, right? These are all fundamental rights that this right-wing Supreme Court um, has taken on with a vengeance. Uh, and so for the next 30 minutes or so, we're gonna talk a little bit about that court what it is doing to destroy our democracy, and what all of us can do to take it back. Um, you know, in just the last year alone, the Supreme Court has ended abortion rights as we know them, has made it more difficult for our government to do anything to tackle the crisis of climate change, the court has opened the floodgates to increased gun violence. It's gutted our Miranda rights. It's eviscerated the separation of church and state, and it's just getting started. This is a court full of right-wing extremists who want to act as some sort of super legislature and impose their agenda on the rest of us against our will. And it's only going to get worse unless we do something to rein them in. You know, this, this is a court that ignores precedent, that cherry picks history, that straight up makes up facts in the cases before them to get the results that they want. Um, and all of this is really rooted in a more fundamental problem, in a deeper disconnect between the right-wing court and the will of the American people, the people that the court is supposed to be serving. Republicans have controlled the court for 50 years. I don't know that that's something that gets as much press and publicity as it should, for 50 years. And that's despite the fact that Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. And unless we do something, unless we do something to create real, actual structural change, they're going to control the court for decades and decades to come. That's 100 years, backwards and forwards, of single party control of one of the most important institutions in our government. That's not how democracy is supposed to work. And yet, and yet, the way that we talk about the court, the way that it gets covered in the media, right, it's as if they're monarchs, they're deities, they exist, right, on this special plane that we mere mortals couldn't possibly understand. Uh, and it tries to give the notion that what the court does, I mean, it really, it really isn't our business, but it is absolutely our business because we're the ones who have to live with the decisions that they make. And Emma, I'm really interested to hear um, your experience and, and what you think about this. You know, you live in Texas. It's really ground zero uh, for the fight to protect abortion rights, voting rights, immigrants' rights, so many of the things that we care about. What, what has your experience been? What's happening on the ground? Um, what has happened since the Dobbs decision? Yeah, um, well, we're about two months out from the Dobbs decision, Roe being overturned, but um, we are also quickly approaching one year since SB 8 was enacted in Texas. and so. Um, while this is newly top of mind across the country, um, Texans have not been able to access abortion care for an entire year past the six-week mark. And I speak on that as a 
you know, repro worker. I also speak on that as a person who in February of this year found themselves pregnant in a criminalized context um, and had to speak on the phone with a clinic that was two miles from my home, uh, be told that they could not offer me care and be referred to a New Mexico clinic 600 miles away. Um, and it's, ex it's devastating to understand that nothing had changed in the safety or efficacy of the abortion care that I was seeking. Um, the only thing that had changed uh, was that now these providers had their hands tied. Um, the court had made this, uh, you know, seen this happen, hadn't stepped in, um, and abandoned us in the state of Texas to navigate it on our own. Um, since then, it, very frankly, people have not been able to access their abortions. People have had to travel for care. Uh, people in this very big time of need have also found themselves unable to lean on support networks that should be able to uh, get them where they need to go, but for fear of criminalization, um, for fear of putting their family, friends, loved ones um, in legally precarious situations, should they be supporters? And on the other hand, uh, should you disclose to the wrong person, finding yourself criminalized? Um, it, it's getting increasingly difficult. Um, and Texas has been and will continue to be the future of abortion in the United States. Um, we're, we're already living the impacts we already have abortion funds who've had to pause their services while we figure out how to navigate this. What does it mean to aid and abet? Um, what does it mean for me as a communications professional to be managing the social media <laughs> of an organization uh, who's sharing information as to self-managed abortion care? Um, is that directly assisting someone in making those choices, whether that message be sent in Texas or across the country? And so it's, it's very difficult, um, and we know that what happens in Texas doesn't stay in Texas. Uh, we're seeing copycat laws pop up. Um, we're seeing um, increasing criminalization um, for pregnancy outcomes, regardless if they include abortion within that spectrum. Um, and so it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult time, and to your point, and these decisions are made elsewhere, but they're impacting people like me, uh, black and brown community members, uh, who, you know, luckily I was a person who knew the options that I had, who knew how to get to where I needed to go to access care. As you can see, I'm not pregnant today. I'm happy not to be, um, but what's, <laughs> yay! <laughs> um, but what happens to the person who doesn't know the options that are still available to them? And what happens when, you know, in one quick phone call that tells you, you're already past six weeks, there's nothing we can do for you here, um, what happens to that individual and how can we step up and show up for them? You know, I, I had been thinking about, it's been not even two months, right, since the Dobbs decision overturning Roe and, and all of the devastating stories that we see like day after day, minute after minute, and all the ones that we don't see, that don't get reported. Um, and it's just so sobering to think about the fact that it's been a year since SB8, that folks in Texas have been living with this for a year, and just how absolutely lawless that was of the Supreme Court. While Roe was still in place, they did this, right? And it just gives you like an insight into how completely free they feel to do whatever they want, no matter the impacts on our lives. And, and that's only one piece of it, right? I mean, there have been decisions this year, um, you know, impacting gun violence, impacting climate, so many decisions on the shadow docket, um, undermining voting rights and the redistricting process in Alabama and Louisiana and Wisconsin. Um, and I'm, you know, curious, Latasha, to hear, to hear your thoughts on those. And also, I think we're all starting to get a pretty good sense of just how bad things are, but how should they be, right? If this court were working the way it should in a democracy, what would it look like? What's the vision? You know, thank you for asking me that question because I do want us to disabuse ourselves from this notion of we got to take back the court. When was the court ours? And I'm, and I'm yeah. raising that because the, the Supreme Court 
And I'm a person from the South, and there have been critical decisions that were made in the court that actually provided protection for my community, or at least extend, had an interpretation of extend rights. But I do want us, I'm, I'm, I'm raising this because I also want us to be mindful around that the Supreme Court it has this deity status because it has always been a tool to, to protect the interests of white supremacy in America, always. Um, and to the extent in which it has shifted, it is when the politics and the, and, and the, politics and the people have demanded that it be shifted. Let's, let's recognize that slavery was legal. It was ordained by the court. The fact that African Americans were three-fifths of a human being, that is what the Supreme Court actually ordained. I'm raising that because I think what we have to really recognize is that as we are moving into, we have a court that does not even reflect the American people. We just got an African American woman on the court, right, for the first time. I'm raising that because I think there are three things as I think about, I want us to think about the court. The three things are, I want us, first and foremost, we have to resist. We cannot say that it is okay and act like the Supreme Court, that they have power that supersedes our powers of people. And so that means we have to literally be organizing and resist what is happening right now, whether that's filing lawsuits, whether that's continuing. I know people say, well, we're not gonna file lawsuits because we might not win. I mean, that's like telling folks who were, were enslaved, it's like telling my ancestors, we're not gonna try to be free because there's a, a, a slavery a law in place. The bottom line is you resist because that's the right thing to do, right? That is the thing that is going to push the boundaries. Uh, the second thing we have to do, I call these the three R's, is we've got to organize. We've got to reorganize ourselves in such a way that people really understand that we have power to be able to shift the court, that that's not a novel idea. The court, Supreme Court has actually been either expanded or shrunk seven times. Most people don't know that, right? And so I'm raising that because we have to also educate and organize people to know that there can be a shift. There's no shrine of, of the, the Supreme Court that you can't make any changes. The third thing related to that is we have to reimagine. We have to radically reimagine because let's be honest that when we're talking about well, what did the founding fathers intended? Well, the fathers, founding fathers didn't intend for me to be talking to y'all up here, right? Because at the end of the day, they couldn't even recognize my humanity, right? So I don't live with the founding fathers. I am a founding mother of a new America. That's who I am, right? And so, and we all have to shift this framework to start seeing ourselves as not just citizens of this nation, but we have to start seeing ourselves as founders of a new nation, a nation that what is in the Constitution, that we all have access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that that is real. That's not just for a select few. And in order to do that, that is going to require us educating people and letting people know, have the opportunity to believe that we can actually create something that is more reflective. Eli Mistel, in his book, he talks about that if you actually expand the court, what it does is it actually prevents the opportunity for actually extremes. Mm -hmm. Because it is, when you have more people than any of you all been a part of a committee, it is much harder <laughs> to come up with an extreme position when you're in a committee than for two or three people to come up with themselves, right? And so there is a benefit for the American people for there to be expansion of the court. We have to shift it out of this frame that is about what party has power and control of the court. We have to shift it into the frame that people have control of the Supreme Court. I feel like I can't nod my head any harder. It's gonna fall off. Because it, it, I think it's just so, so incredibly critical, the, the point that you made, Latasha, that we have to peel back these fictions that we've had about the court. You know, this pretend sense that it lives in this magical universe of perfect law and reason um, and has the power to rule over us when it has always, always been, save, I don't know, maybe seven to ten years, an institution that has reinforced um, the powerful, that has taken power away from people that has reinforced conservative institutions. And right now, it's doing that on steroids. Um, and so that education work is, is so incredibly critical. That reimagining um, is so incredibly critical. Um, you know, I, I take back the court. Um, we have been laser focused 
um, since, since our inception several years ago on Supreme Court expansion, on adding seats to the Supreme Court, which as you said has been done seven times before in history, right? right? That's, it's something, not that we love them, but that the founding fathers did. Right, right? absolutely. So it is, it is in the toolbox, and we've been focused on that because that is the way to wrest control away from these justices who are dead set on undermining our democracy and to create a new institution that actually supports it. And also because it lets us be real about what the problem is. Um, and how bad the problem is, and that we can't just like paper it over or, or prop it up, right? We have to actually take it head on. You, you, the only piece, the, the part that I also want to build off of what you're saying is we have to see this moment as an opportunity. Yes. Now, oftentimes we see what's happening, it was like, oh my goodness, like, we, we, why are they doing this? As if they were okay before, right? We literally have to see this as an opportunity to organize our communities around how do we create a justice system that is really rooted in justice, not punitive measures where we have more people incarcerated than anywhere in the world, not when we know that corporations are protected more than people, not when we know that workers' rights are being struck down, not when we have a court that tells us what rights we don't have instead of protecting the rights that we should have as human rights. I'm saying that because I really want us to recognize in this moment, we can't get caught up in the partisan paradigm either. Mm -hmm. That we think this is just about a party having control over the court. That we have to really push this and recognize that we've got to restructure and have a court system that has some sense of accountability. Currently, our court system is the deity that has no accountability. You go there, you do what you want to do, you die there. Right, and so, and, and it's also been politicized in a way. So how do we, I think the only way that we can actually reverse that trend is we have to reimagine what the court system should look like that would actually be in service of, the, of people. And, and I think we're seeing right now a real, a real openness to that among people, right, in communities as we're feeling the, continuing to feel the devastating impacts of the decisions that keep coming down and it keeps becoming more and more real in people's lives. Emma, I'm curious, um, you know, how, how this work of court reform, how this work of um, re-envisioning um, what, what the court should be, what role it should play, plays into your organizing work. You know, your organization, we testify, it's amazing. If you don't know it, you should. Um, focuses on, on, you know, sharing folks' experiences of seeking abortion care. And you might not automatically think, oh, well, gee, you know, you'd be on a panel about court reform. <laughs> so how, when you're talking to communities, when you're talking to your storytellers, when you're doing that organizing, how, how does this fit in? Yeah, um, well, the great thing about We Testify is we are 100% staffed by people who have had abortions. Um, and what that means for us is our allegiance is primarily and first and foremost to folks who have had abortions, uh, who are in the process of seeking abortion care and who will have abortions in the future. We don't have an allegiance to a deity, a certain court, um, a president. Um, we're here to enable folks into making the decisions that they need, accessing the care that they need. Um, and how that plays into our work is um, our decision to uh, join the Just Democracy Coalition uh, to make sure that uh, we are pushing out the message of all the different options that are on the table to expand abortion care. The same way that we uh, will share the message of all the different types of abortion care that are needed um, and all the, the breadth of abortion stories that need to be out there when we're advocating for medication abortion, in-clinic abortion, self-managed abortions, herbal abortions, if that's your choice as well, uh, whether you're a person that has to travel who sought an abortion for a medical reason because your own health was in danger or you simply didn't want to be pregnant. Um, that same way, we're looking at all the different options that are on the table to expand access to abortion care, whether that be expanding the court, whether that be ending the filibuster, whether that be DC statehood. All of those different options are on the table and we're going to talk about it. Um, sometimes we are the ones sticking out our necks and it's taken a little bit longer for you know national organizations to get out there with us, uh, but because we have have uh, abortion havers in mind from the jump, then that's who we are thinking about when we're 
supporting certain policy, when we're, we're getting out there within our organizing work. Um, and it goes beyond the messaging that we're sharing online. Uh, we're also investing in the abortion storytellers themselves. And so when we are deciding that we're going to support court expansion, we're also having meetings with our storytellers to explain the issue to them so that, that we're not just using their stories to you know, propel forward our mission or our goal so that they truly understand and can grow as thought leaders so that they can be on a stage such as this one to say, I have an opinion on this. I've also lived this experience. This is what it means to me and this is you know, why you should support us. And that's a big message for us is to invest in abortion storytellers because we should be at every table. Um, we should be in every space where decisions are being made. Um, if this is going to be the focus of so much you know, attention and work and restricting our access, um, then we need to have uh, the people that are actually impacted there. That's amazing. Um, and you know, to, to Latasha's point earlier, right, we are the people who should be shaping the law, who should be shaping these institutions. They're supposed to be accountable to us. They're supposed to serve us. Um, and I, I think we're seeing a lot, of, a lot more recognition that there's something really, really wrong, right? The Supreme Court's approval rating right now is in free fall. It is plummeting. I mean, honestly, it's probably lower right now than it was when we started this panel. And that's because people don't want to be ruled by some justices trying to bring back some like 18th century way of being, repeal the whole 20th century, all the progress that we've made together, and tell us that we're not full humans with equal rights who can decide what we want to do about our own bodies, right? So like people don't want that in their lives. Um, Latasha, you mentioned this was a this is a moment, this is an opportunity. Are there things you think are are holding us back, or what do we need to break through in order to continue to build this movement and, and do that really critical education that says the court is not some untouchable god, right? It's a part of our government and it's responsible to us. This, this may be hard, but we're going to have to lean in the discomfort of change. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is that we also have an affection and attachment to that which we know. Mm -hmm. And so part of, we, part of the reason why the Supreme Court continues, we continue to be in this volley between, well, do the Democrats have control of the court or whether the, uh, the Republicans have control of the court, as if the court belongs a, is another you know, power tool for political parties instead of literally being a, a, being a uh, part of the government that literally is in some space looking for the best interest of democracy and its citizens. And so because of that, part of the politicization of the court we are partly responsible. I know that's hard for us to accept, but it is because in many ways we've actually accepted that the model that we currently have, that that model is we just got to get more, we just got to get more people on it. We just got to take control over it. Yes, that may be a temporary solution, but in order for us to have justice in this country, let's, let, let's be honest, at the moment in which the Supreme Court was de um, and this democracy was envisioned, it was by white men of wealth that the majority of people in this country were not even a consideration. So why are we using them as the footnote of what did they think, right? They didn't even consider most of us, including white men that didn't have land. They didn't consider you either, right? And so I'm raising that because I think that it's really important for us to really see that part of if we are to have the democracy that we desire and we deserve, it is going to require us going to have an evolution of thought. And it is going to require us to be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right, with change ourselves. And it's going to require us being experimental, right? We're going to have to be innovative and experimental on, on the local level, on really being able to start having these conversations with our, our networks, with our communities. Whether you do work in the space around Supreme Court or not, we all should be talking about it on some level and having discussions so that we are actually we're actually getting the base ready. It's almost like if you're a farmer, you got to till the soil. And so this is the moment that with the Supreme Court so out of place. Now, in the meantime, we got to win these elections in the midterms, right? Um, so that there are some checks and balances. But at the end of the day, we have a short term. Sometimes we're so focused on the short term victory. We've got to get this person, this party in that we're missing the opportunity of really how we're going to make long term structural change so that we don't have to continue to go in this endless valley of who is in charge and who has power. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. Um, and I think, you know, do, doing those things at the same time, right, this, this short-term short urgency that we have um, as these decisions keep coming down, as the court keeps taking actions, um, like it has in voting rights cases over the last couple of years, and there are more on the docket in the fall, right? This court is gonna continue to take actions to like further insulate itself um, from the people, from democracy, from you know, the ability that we have to make change. So, so there is an urgency and also it's a long-term fight. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long-term fight that we all have to really like sign up for and dig in and be committed to. You know, we didn't get um, we didn't get the situation that we're faced with now overnight. That's right. Um, the right, the conservatives, they have focused on this for a very, very long time, um, and it is time. It is time for progressives to step, step into this fight, um, to step into this power, um, to, to take it seriously, and to change this institution so that we actually can have some justice at some point. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have here today like all these amazing activists in this room, everybody watching at home. If there were well, I'm not gonna give you a number. One thing, two things, three things, any number of things. You wanna make sure um, that folks uh, come away from this conversation thinking about um, what are they? Emma, can I start with you? You know, first and foremost, as we say at We Testify, everyone loves someone who's had an abortion. Um, and so keep that in mind in your work. Uh, look into yourself. What abortion stigma are you still carrying? What makes you uncomfortable about this conversation? Because we are moving into new spaces where we're putting folks uh, to share their own stories. So um, how can you step up for us and um, let abortion storytellers take the lead? Uh, we can play the game while at the same time saying this shit is rigged. <laughs> we are, uh, we're out here, we're doing the work, but we can still criticize the establishment, the systems that are in place, uh, and acknowledge the fact that uh, it doesn't work for us, and we need to be making change. That's right. Thank you. Natasha? You know, I'm from Selma, Alabama, and so if there was something that I would leave to tell people to do, you know, it would be in the same wise words of those who were the 600 people who actually were on the Edmund Pettus Bridge that didn't have politics on their side, they didn't have government, they didn't have money, but they were able to actually push democracy, this country closer to democracy than anybody else. And with that, well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. That's my words. So I will just say thank you. Thank you so much, Latasha. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, all of you here today. If this conversation has inspired you to, to get more uh, into the fight, uh, to reshape the, the Supreme Court, to take back our democracy, please reach out. Reach out to us at Take Back the Court. Black Voters Matter, we testify. We would love, love to work with you. Um, let's get this done. Nation, thank you for coming. Check out your app for the great happy hour.